Welcome, everyone. Um, thank you for being here. Uh, we're we're going to get started. Uh, so this is day two with Stateful Applications, implementing a data protection strategy. A little bit about ourselves. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Deepika Dixit. I'm a member of technical staff at Caston. I have a background in storage. I previously worked at Tintry, and I've graduated from ASU. Hi, and I'm Vaibhav Kamra. I'm the co-founder and CTO at Caston. I'm also a contributor on a project called Canister, so we'll talk a little bit about that today as well. Uh, previously, I've done databases at Microsoft, file systems and storage at uh, Maginatics, and most recently, I was doing data protection at EMC. Uh, so very happy to talk to you about this topic. It's very near and dear to us. At Caston, we do data management for cloud-native applications, so uh, data protection is one of those things. So. Um, hope to make this relevant for you guys. So what are we going to talk about today? So the first half of the talk, we'll talk about where the data is when it comes to applications in Kubernetes. Um, what do we really mean by stateful applications? Everybody has their own definition. Um, we'll talk about what data protection is, um, you know, just set the problem up for everyone. And the second half, we will talk about what it takes to get this right in Kubernetes, um, hopefully give a blueprint for all of us to use when we're thinking about it in our environments. We'll also talk about uh, tools that we can use that are available out there. Um, we'll also do an end-to-end -end demo that will show all of this and bring it all together. So quick show of hands. Uh, who here is running stateful applications in Kubernetes? All right. And so by this, what I mean is you're using persistent volumes, you're deploying databases in Kubernetes, you're using data services, Elasticsearch, Redis, a whole bunch of things, right? And let me ask you a little slightly different question. Who's running applications that store data outside of Kubernetes? So you're using a managed service, Cloud SQL, Amazon RDS, something like that. Great, thank you. So that is a good segue into this slide. So when it comes to applications in Kubernetes, there are, whole, uh, there are different ad adoption patterns that we see. The first one is what we just talked about. Uh, so the empty hexagon there, those are pods, right? So you've got pods which have no state and you've got pods that have state. So the first pattern is that all the data services, all the data is in Kubernetes. You're either using volumes or you're using a database like Postgres or something else. The second one is you're still all in Kubernetes, but your data services and your application are logically separate. Uh, they're deployed, managed independently. So if you think about the database as a service pattern, the pattern where people are using operators to deploy databases, this is what we see. And then you've got applications that will communicate with the databases or the data services, I, I should say, using either control or data APIs. And then there's a third one, which we also talked about, where your, your, all your data services are outside, um, and you're, again, you're using control APIs to provision, you're using data APIs to, to talk to those. And so what we're going to talk about today um, covers all of this, because I think these are all valid patterns when you're building your applications. There are pros and cons to, to each of them, um, but what we will talk about will apply to everything. So what is data protection? Let's, let's set that up. Um, at a very high level, it means that you have systems in place to recover applications and the data uh, if things go bad. And there are a bunch of reasons or you would need this, um, dealing with accidental or malicious data loss. Um, so think bugs in your code that we need to recover from, you got hit with ransomware, infrastructure failure to deal with, application misconfiguration. Uh, this is the, uh, I have a typo in my config file and suddenly a production was pointing to dev. Um, it, it does happen. Uh, and then regulatory reasons. In certain environments, um, having systems in place like this is a, is a requirement. And when you think about, when we think about data protection strategy, there are certain elements, certain things that are table stakes, and especially in these environments at scale. Automation around our backup and recovery processes, um, policies in place that will take care of scheduling and retirement, Security, so you want to make sure you have the right controls in place, who has access to what, who can restore encryption. Um, SLAs around recovery, so how long is thing, are things going to take, how much data may I, I might lose. Uh, this is all important, but most important is doing all of this at scale. So we're in a day two talk over here. Day two in Kubernetes is all about doing things at scale, doing things in a repeatable way, not having manual processes, and also handling all sorts of applications that are gonna show up in our cluster, not just the, the one application or the two application, right? Now, 
everything I think I, I said right now, I think this is a pretty standard part of any operational playbook. I'm sure we're all aware of it if we're running environments in production. But when it comes to Kubernetes, application, applications in Kubernetes, I think there's some misconceptions out there that we should just talk about because this is something that keeps coming up over and over again. So the first one is I don't have any stateful applications in Kubernetes. So this is obviously changing. I mean, the show of hands shows that. But also when, when people make the statement or when we, when we hear this, it's really a description of where the data lives rather than the application itself. The application has state. What we're saying here is that the state may be outside of Kubernetes, and that's okay. You still have data that's valuable, and you still need a strategy in place. Second one is uh, my data stores are replicated. Right? Um, they, I'm using a cloud-native database. I'm using X or Y, and so why do I need something like this? Now, replication is, a, is great for resiliency. It can hel help you with infrastructure failures. But when it comes to dealing with uh, accidental data loss, malicious data loss, configuration issues, you still need a complete data protection strategy. You need um, points in time, backup and recovery. So, so that's, that's what, what's important here. And the third one, which I think we'll spend a little bit more time on, is my underlying infrastructure. I'm using a cloud service. I'm using a storage system. I'm using a database that already has um, things like backup and recovery. So why do I need something else? So for this, let's, let's make it a little bit visual, because um, I think that'll help us, and we'll keep coming back to this one later as well. So let's look at what a typical cloud-native application looks like. Um, you might have a service. Um, I'm gonna see if this shows up. I think it's big enough. So you might have, let's say, a front-end service that's behind an ingress over there. Um, let's say it has a couple of other back-end microservices. Um, microservice architectures are what you'll see a lot in these environments. Let's say they're stateful. So the first one is, using a volume, it's putting unstructured data on there. And you've got another one that's using, um, it's using a cloud database for some structured data. So this is a pretty typical pattern for cloud native applications. Now when you think about the operational unit here, what do you care about? What do we um, deploy? What do we want to manage? What do we want to back up? And eventually, if we have an issue, what do we want to recover? It is this entire thing. It is the application. Um, Doing that at the infrastructure level becomes really hard. So when I'm sitting at, for example, the storage layer over there, or within Amazon RDS, I've got a backup policy running over there, it has no awareness about the entire application. It has no awareness of what the dependencies are. Are there microservices that I need ordering against, across? Do I need to collect uh, backup all of this at one time together? Uh, there's Kubernetes. I mean, how is all of this going to tie into Kubernetes? There's no real awareness of that layer. So it becomes really hard to do this at just the infrastructure layer. You need to do this in an application-aware manner. And that's really why, for our Kubernetes applications, we need a data protection strategy that starts at the application level. So now that we've set the problem up a bit, let's talk about implementation. And so implementation, there, there are a variety of things to talk about. What I'm, trying to, what I'm gonna try and do is um, offer a blueprint of things to think about, maybe four or five, whenever you're thinking about data protection. So I would, I would hope that people can take this back, look at their own environments, their own applications, and consider each topic in here and say, okay, what am I gonna do about A, B, and C? So we're gonna go through those. The first one is, again, I've got that picture of that application over there. So what are we going to do about the Kubernetes resources, the application configuration? Um, I might have other information I need to recover this application. I might have shared secrets in my environment. I might, I might need pipeline information. How was this deployed? What environment was it running in? So we need to think about how we're going to capture that information when we're trying to back up an application. Um, when it comes to the Kubernetes resources, there are a few techniques. You can go to the API server, and that really gives you what the runtime state is. Um, if it's all infrastructure as code, you can go and you can get a source code reference. You could go re refer to your repository. If you're using something like Helm, um, you can protect the Helm chart. You can bring that in, or even just store a reference. But that's something we do need to worry about, because applications are so dynamic that configurations change Quite, quite often in these environments. So if you're backing up data, you want to make sure that you get the configuration that actually matches that data if you ever want to recover this. The next one is what we think about most often is what are we going to do about the persistent data? And this really depends on where the data is. So if the data is in volumes, we've got a few options over there. We can, if the storage system supports it, we can leverage volume snapshots. 
We can use file system backups. A very popular technique and actually very powerful is to use a combination of both, right? Take volume, use a volume snapshot to get a quick, consistent copy of the volume and then use file system backups to extract what you need. If you're dealing with data services in the application, again, you have a few options there. You can snapshot underlying volumes. Um, this will give you something which is crash consistent. Really depends on whether your application can deal with this or not. If not, you can use application level tools. So think of using, uh, this would be for example, using MySQL dump with MySQL or a Postgres tool or a Mongo tool. Using both of these in, in a combination is also very powerful, especially when you start to think of large data sets. And then if you're dealing with managed services, similarly, you're gonna, you can use application level tools. I can use MySQL dump to extract data out of RDS if I want to. The managed service may also offer APIs that'll give me um, a copy of the data that I can use as part of my backup set. Now, once we figured out what we wanna capture, you start getting into the, the, looking into what the workflow is gonna be for backup and, and restore. And I think this is important as well because what, turns out, what it turns out to be is that every application has a particular workflow for both for backup or for recovery or for, for whatever you wanna do with the data. Um, you might have application requirements. I might want to order the, the steps, uh, how steps run across the application. I might need to quiesce the application. I might have pre and post um, steps to run. You're dealing with Kubernetes over here. Remember we talked about bringing back um, the entire application. You need to worry about how are you gonna orchestrate this in Kubernetes? What resources need to get created before? How do you get volumes from snapshots, stateful sets from those volumes? So let's use an example to actually illustrate what I mean by workflow orchestration and why you need to think about it. So if you look at the um, standard recovery playbook for Postgres, for example, if I'm getting Postgres back from physical backups, if Postgres was running in a VM, I would go in there, I would shut down the Postgres server, I would restore the database and the, the log files, I'd run a recovery step, and then finally when I'm done, I start Postgres. And that works great. What happens in a containerized environment when I'm running in Kubernetes? As soon as you shut down Postgres, if you get to that container, the container's gonna shut down. When the container shuts down, the pod goes away, you lose access to the database, the files, all the other steps in the workflow, you can't do anymore. So you need to worry about now, okay, what am I gonna do with my recovery playbook? What, the, what is the workflow gonna look like in Kubernetes? So one option to, do, to use here is using init containers. But in init containers, it becomes really brittle because what happens is you end up embedding script, embedded scripts in your application um, in a sidecar container. A better approach, um, for example, is to do this. And this is how you would orchestrate this on Kubernetes. You can scale down the original Postgres instance you can start another pod, and this is a container that has all your tools, has Postgres in there, but you can control the lifetime of it. You can attach those volumes that have all the data. Then you can go and run the rest of the steps of the workflow, restore the database files, Postgres recovery. Finally, when you're done, you shut down this pod and then bring, scale up the original Postgres application. Again, those volumes go get attached, you're good to go. So this is kind of what I mean by thinking about orchestration in these environments. Finally, um, I think considering where you're gonna put your backups, backup storage becomes really important um, and what format you're gonna put in there, that's something to think, up, think about. Object storage tends to be a really good choice. It's scalable, it's low cost, uh, has many tiering options, has the right controls for security, so you can say who has access to what. Uh, encryption has really good integration over there, so I, I think this is a great option to use. If you're leveraging data service snapshots, so if you're leveraging volume snapshots, if you're leveraging RDS snapshots, then one of the things to think about is what are, going, what are the requirements or what are the guarantees the underlying system is gonna give me? Um, think about a storage appliance that you take a snapshot on. Those snapshots are not really backups because when the appliance goes away, the snapshots are gone. If you're taking snapshots in the cloud, you might get better guarantees, so this is something to consider. Portability is another one, so think about what environment you're gonna to have to recover these applications in. Uh, is the same infrastructure gonna be there? If it is, then you might be able to use a snapshot that's tied to that infrastructure. If not, you might have to make things portable. For example, take a volume snapshot and then run a file system backup out of that to, to, make the, to extract the data. Lastly, I mean, obvious stuff. I, mean, I think encryption is something that at this point everybody does think about. 
But what we find is that security in terms of who has access to what, especially you're talking about lots of applications getting backed up. Um, it's as good as having access to the application. So you have to worry about who has access to the data, who is allowed to restore. So you need to write, uh, make sure you have the right controls in place. So that was me. That was the first part. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Deepika, who's actually going to show this in action with a, a sample application, talk about what tools we can use in these environments as well. Right. Thank you, Weber. So now that you've seen that what all goes into uh, implementing or even thinking about a data protection strategy, let's look at a demo app and see how we would go about with the same. Uh, so here, if you can see, uh, we have a simple application. It's a stateful application. It is a deployment with one replica set, uh, with one replica. So it has one pod, and we've given it three persistent volumes. So it's using MySQL for one of the volumes, and then it has some config data in the other one, and it has an unstructured file data. So it is a simple, typical stateful application that uh, anyone could run in their Kubernetes cluster. Uh, let's go to the demo and see what this would look like in our cluster. So. I think everybody can see that. We've pre-recorded it to speed things up. Uh, so we can get uh, the cluster and see what it looks like actually uh, in production. Hopefully that's large enough. Yeah. I, uh, oh, it got cut off a little. OK, I just did a get on deployment pods and service and the PVC. So if you look, uh, there is one deployment picture gallery, and we have one pod running with it. Uh, and apart from that, uh, we have three volumes. So we have this MySQL, and then we have the config, and then we have the pictures. Uh, we can also go and look at what the UI looks like for this. So that will give us a better idea of what kind of an app we are dealing with. So hey, look, it's Fippy. And we have 12 pictures over here. It's a simple picture gallery. Fippy's crying. Uh, we'll get back to it later. And so it's a typical application. Uh, which is using some persistent volumes. Uh, now we need to back up and restore an application like this. So for that, we're going to introduce a tool. Uh, our tool here is Canister. Uh, it's an open source project. Uh, what it does is it's going to help you plan your data protection workflows, and it's going to use Kubernetes custom resources for that. So that gives you a single pane of control. Uh, if you know how to use kubectl, you know how to use Canister. It's as simple as that. And the, another important thing is uh, Canister has its own primitives for data capture to and from a variety of data sources. So you, you can have a block storage, have your local file system, MySQL, Postgres. Canister has a lot of primitives for data capture. And the most important thing that even Weber mentioned before is uh, we all have a data protection plan, but we need somebody to orchestrate all the workflow for us. Uh, like we saw in the Postgres example, there's a bunch of extra steps that are needed to have a complete data protection story. So Canister will help you orchestrate that. So you you just tell, it the, uh, tell Canister what workflow needs to be done. It will execute all the steps, all the queuing. Everything will be taken care of for you. Uh, so let's get back to the app and see what a backup workflow would look like. So uh, if you remember, our app has a single pod, and it has a couple of volumes. So a typical backup workflow would be something like this. Uh, we will first go and discover the volumes. Then we need to snapshot uh, the PVCs and the underlying volumes. And then lastly, we need to store this snapshot information somewhere. So it could be some backup storage, which is local, or it could be in cloud. Uh, now, how does Canister help you do this? Uh, so in Canister, we define something called as a blueprint, which is a Kubernetes custom resource. So let's start writing the blueprint. Uh, since it's a Kubernetes resource, we have uh, the typical API version and kind in there. And next up, we're going to define something called as actions. So we're going to tell it that you are going to, uh, this blueprint has a bunch of actions. The first one we're going to define is backup. So for backup uh, is an action, and it's working on type deployment. So this blueprint is telling what needs to be done for this action, and it's working on type deployment. Uh, say, instead of deployment, we could have stateful sets or any other Kubernetes resource. This particular blueprint is working on our picture gallery, which is a deployment, which is why the type here is deployment. So next up is output artifacts. Uh, if you see the third step is you need to push the backup info somewhere into uh, backup storage. So the backup info in there is location details, where you want the data to go. And the last but the most important is phases. So these are the steps in the workflow that need to be captured for a backup action. So here we are using an inbuilt canister function called create volume snapshot. It's a canister primitive which will help you discover the PVCs, then it will snapshot the underlying volumes, and lastly it will push the backup info using the backup info artifacts that we have mentioned before. Uh, 
So this is how a backup blueprint would look like. Now let's continue writing this blueprint, but first let's look at restored workflow. So assume we have a backup, we have everything in place, now something went wrong, so we want to do a restore. So for our application, the restore steps would probably be look like, first we need to scale down the application, then we should delete the existing PVCs, then we should create the new PVCs from the snapshot that we have taken already, and then finally scale the application back up. So let's continue writing the blueprint, and this time we'll define a new action, restore. So again, the action is restore. It's working on type deployment. And here, instead of output artifacts, we have input artifacts. So since the restore needs information about the snapshot, where it's coming from, where it's stored, all the information goes in over here. And the next step is phases. Now, backup was simple. In restore, we have a couple more phases. So first up, we are using the canister and build function to scale the workload down. Next up, we are doing create volumes from snapshot, which is another canister inbuilt function. Here, as you can see, it's using the backup info to get information for where the volume snapshot uh, lies in. And lastly, we are going to scale the workload back up. So I'm going to pause here for a minute for you to take in all the information. It's a, blue, it's a, a blueprint is, again, a custom resource in Kubernetes. So it's a simple YAML file. What we are doing is we, def we are defining the actions. Here, for this application, we have backup and restore. And then we are defining the phases that go along with it. So we can go back to the demo and see how Canister is actually doing this in action. So let's go back to the demo. I'm using something called as CanCuttle, which is a Canister tool which is helping us create a custom resource called Action Set. And Action Set helps you execute the blueprint that we just defined. Uh, so again, it's a Kubernetes custom resource. You could have all this information in a YAML if you're more comfortable with that and use kubectl apply to do that. We're just using cancuddle because it's easier to create, for, uh, create a CR through this. So we are doing a create on Action Set. Uh, the action type here is backup since we want to execute the backup part first. And then we are telling that we want to use the blueprint that we just defined. So we are telling it blueprint is picture gallery. And we are telling that do this on the deployment picture gallery, which is in the canister namespace. So we are giving cancuddle all the information it needs to start executing the blueprint. Uh, last up is profile, which is the backup information that we mentioned. So it has all the location details that it needs. And as simple as that, an action set was created by cancuddle. So what cancuddle did is it created a custom resource, it validated it, and then it applied to, to Kubernetes. If you are more comfortable writing a YAML, that's also perfectly fine. Um, again, action set is a Kubernetes custom resource, so we can do a kubectl describe and get uh, the information for the action set. So let's do that. So I'm going to pause. If you see at the bottom of the page, you can see a bunch of events that this action set went through. So first up was started. it started to execute the backup uh, action. Uh, next up, since the backup workflow, if you remember, just had one phase. So that was the backing up the volume. So it started executing that phase. And then once that was complete, it marked the status as complete for this particular action set. So the action set is marked complete. And if we scroll up, we can see that for every volume that this snapshot was taken for, we have something called as volume snapshot info. So that has all the snapshot ID, all the metadata it needs, which can be used later on for restore. So for every volume, we have all the data we need in this action set for the backup that we just took. Now let's go back to the application. Let's go back to crying Fippy, and we'll go ahead and delete something and see if we can restore from uh, our backup. So uh, let's just, yeah, it's 12 pictures. So I'm going to go delete crying Fippy. I don't like this picture. And I'm going to delete these two as well. So now we have 10 pictures. And uh, the story looks incomplete. And I don't think that's expected. So I'm going to try and restore and see if we can get crying Fippy back. So let's go back to our demo. Uh, in the terminal. And again, we are using cancuddle, same thing. Uh, it will create an action set. But this time, the action that we are asking it to perform is restore. And the input parameters are pretty simple. Since we already took a backup, we are going to tell it that create this action set restore from and the backup that we just created. So as I mentioned before, the backup has all the information we need. So the restore action is pretty simple. It just gets the information from the backup. And the action set is created. And again, uh, CanCuddle created it for us. We didn't have to do anything. Uh, but if you're comfortable with YAML, you can do that as well. 
Uh, let's do a kubectl describe on this as well and see if the execution of this uh, restore has uh, begun. So as you can see, the execution is still in progress. Uh, it had a couple of phases. The first phase is done, which is shutting down the pod. And then now it's uh, in the volumes phase. So we're going to do a wait on the volumes to see if they are bound. So the MySQL and the config file, if you can see, they are new. And uh, the PIX is coming up. So once that's bound, I th uh, the action set will go into the next phase, which was scaling up the workload back up. So we're going to look at the action set again to see where it's at. Uh, as you can see, the, the first and the second phase is completed. We are in the third phase of bringing the pods up. So let's just look at the pod status and see if it's up. And the pod seems to be running. So we can just go back and see, uh, check on our deployment, see if everything is in place the way we expected it to be, uh, like the uh, deployment, the pods, and the volumes. So as you can see, uh, we have the deployment from before, the same picture gallery deployment, but now it has a new pod and new volumes to it. Hopefully, it has restored crying fippy, and we'll go back and look at the UI to see if, if that's in place. So let's refresh. And yes, there are 12 pictures, and crying fippy is back. Happy to be restored, and all the, the story is complete. It worked. <laughs> <laughs> so, so back to the blueprint. So that is how Canister helps you uh, execute your workflows for you. That's what we mean by orchestration. So we define the blueprint. It works on the type deployment. We gave it all the phases it needed. And then we use Canister to help orchestrate that. Now, this blueprint is pretty generic. As you can see, it is working on PVCs. Uh, so the backup phase is pretty simple. The restore phase is comparatively simple. Uh, you can customize this blueprint as per your need. Since this is working on PVCs and a deployment, I can actually reuse it for another uh, example. But I can also customize it to my application. So maybe my application needs some pre, pre and post hooks. Or maybe I want to use uh, a typical a third party tool, like a MySQL dump or something in the middle. I can add that as well. Uh, blueprints are meant to be like shareable and you can customize them as per your need. You can uh, keep them as simple as you want, or you can keep them as uh, kind of detailed as you want. And uh, we have a few on the website, so you can go check them out as well. I'll get, get I'll show the link later. Uh, so here's the link for Canister, the first one which we just discussed. It's an open source project. So the picture gallery app that I just discussed is on there with all the steps that you need to execute it. There's also a bunch of other examples like MySQL and Postgres. You can go, go and look. Uh, the next, if you want an enterprise version of this, we have a website on Castin. You can go check that out. Apart from that, uh, as I can see that the community has been very active, especially for stateful applications and backup and restore. There's a bunch of other projects that are worthy of mention, like Arc, then there's Reshifter, there's also Kubernetes Snapshot, there's Stash. And if you look at the last link, uh, the community has uh, created uh, an exhaustive list of projects that are there. So all things stateful is there at that link. And we've uploaded the slides, so you can go and have a look at them at your ease. Uh, now, what we just discussed was definitely important, but there are some other topics that we couldn't get to today which are equally important when you're thinking about a data protection strategy. So you need to think about cataloging your snapshots and your backup. You also need to think about scheduling and retirement of these, uh, as well as you need to be able to validate your snapshots, because a snapshot is not useful until you have restored from it. So you need to have a plan for validation and testing of these snapshots. And lastly, all this you need to be able to integrate into CI CD. Uh, we had a talk yesterday on this. Hopefully, you guys made to it. But if you didn't, uh, look for the slides. They'll be up, and you will get a more detailed version of that. Uh, that's it from us for now. I think we'll take questions. But if you want to discuss something offline or in detail, we have a booth. So please come or check us out over there. And I think I'll open the floor for questions. Thank you. Are you talking about in this particular example? So the question was, where does, we talked about scheduling, where does the schedule live when it comes to Canister Blueprint? So Canister itself does not have scheduling. Um, you can build a schedule around it, whether you want to use cron jobs or, or any other tool. Yeah, exactly. And 
The other one I was going to say is that we're also seeing a lot of people integrate this into pipeline, so CI CD. So use that as a scheduler as well if, that, if that's a better option. Canister uh, can work with any, any underlying cloud provider or even your local on-prem storage. So it's a framework. You can plug and play with it as you wish. Whichever cloud provider, it doesn't matter. So if you want to plug in something, you can send it. Yes, yes, you can. And something we're doing as well. I mean, we, um, you know, uh, you can ping us on Slack over there if you want, uh, if you're looking for something specific. What we are planning to do with Canister is really, and what I should have mentioned earlier, is the community is doing a lot of work with volume snapshots and CSI. And so our goal is to make sure we support that. Right now, that's not there. It's still alpha. So what we're doing is for storage providers, we pick one and we go and implement the snapshotting capability. Um, but as soon as that shows up, we'll, we'll start using that. And that'll open up a lot of more providers for us. Um, well, Canister is definitely a tool that you can use for that. And I don't know if the question is specific to Canister or is gen in general. Similar Right, OK. So thank you. So the question was, what's the feasibility of orchestrating a cluster restore with a tool like Canister? So we've definitely actually done this in practice. Um, Deepika mentioned K10, something that we work on, which is more enterprise, but that actually uses Canister under the covers and, and is something that we do use in practice. Um, one of the things to consider is backup storage, and this is one of the reasons why I would highly recommend using object storage for this. It tends to be scale out, give you the performance you need, um, and plugs in really well into this environment. So the question was, on the back end, you should be able to integrate with any storage provider if it's a PVC. Is that, that's, yes, and that's correct. Um, at this point of time, we do leverage volume snapshot functionality. So it really, and since that's not surfaced as a standard API yet, the API is in alpha, and the CSI providers, um, drivers are getting to 1.0. Um, so what that means right now is that you, every provider you want to support, you need to go and understand the infrastructure, go call those provider APIs. So we're adding support for, um, we already have AWS there, Google, IBM, um, Ceph, and those should start to show up soon. Um, but really our goal, our roadmap, is to really align with the CSI and the uh, volume snapshot APIs from Kubernetes. Exactly. If you are doing a CSI driver for your provider, then 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 it will work, and we're working on that. Uh, I, yes, I do know about you. Uh, the question was: uh, Does OpenEBS have the features that you need for this? I believe it does. I believe it does have a snapshot API. I do not know if they have a CSI provider, but I know there's someone here who can comment on that and tell us. Do you have a CSI provider for OpenEBS? It's coming. It's coming with snapshots? Uh, All right. So soon. Okay. All right. Question. So the question was, do you support incremental backups? Um, to answer that, uh, there are a variety of cases where we do support incremental backups. So. Uh, Canister allows you to hook in at the application level when it comes to databases. And if so, if you look at the examples on the website when it comes to something like Postgres, it, we do support incremental backups over there. And in fact, we offer point in time recovery as well because we're using physical backups and walls. When you're dealing with volume snapshots, um, often the volume snapshot, the storage provider will do incremental backups. So we get some of it over there. And then finally, when we're dealing with storage providers that don't have um, volume uh, incremental support, we use file system, we use a tool called RESTIC, which gives us deduplication. And so you can build an incremental story over there. Okay. Questions? Anything else? This is great. Okay. 
Thank you very much. I hope this was helpful. Come find us. Yeah, thank you.